Let us pray. Father in heaven, we're so grateful today for your protection over uh, Amanda uh, last week as she fell off uh, the side of the bluff. And Lord, I, I know that your angels were there to comfort her and, and to protect her until the um, paramedics were able to get to her. And Lord, I thank you right now even for the healing that you're working in her life. And Lord, I pray you continue uh, to bring healing and recovery to her. And Lord, I pray that her life might be a living testimony, a witness to her peers who think that they have all the time in the world. But Lord, we must be ready today. Father, we thank you today for your Holy Spirit, who you tell us in your word will guide us into all truth. And as we seek you in your word today and read your word, that you will bring uh, clarity and understanding uh, to the time that we're living in and to uh, the faith that we need to have. And we pray this in the blessed name of your son, Jesus. Amen. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, I invite you to open them with me to the book of Revelation, Revelation in chapter 3, and we'll be starting in verse 7. So far in our Bible studies at prayer meeting, we've been going through the seven churches of Revelation. We started with Ephesus, which the Bible calls the loveless church as they lost their first love. And then we moved on to the church of Smyrna which was the persecuted church, which we actually find a lot of similarities between Smyrna and the church we're going to be reading about today. We moved on from Smyrna to Pergamos, which was a church that began to compromise. We moved on from the compromising church to Thyatira, which was a corrupt church. That's what happens when you begin to compromise. You become corrupted. And then finally, we read about Sardis, which was a dead church. But today, we're going to study about a faithful church. And this is the church that God desires for us to be. And while each of the seven churches were actually little church, literal churches in John's time that John was writing to, they also represent symbolically churches throughout the ages of history. And at this stage in earth's history, we're actually living in the, the time of Laodicea. But as we study about Philadelphia, hopefully God plants a spark in our hearts that we would desire to be like them during a time where most are lukewarm. So as you have your Bibles open with me, we're going to be reading Revelation chapter 3, verses 7 to 13. Here Jesus speaks these words to John the Revelator in Revelation 3, verse 7. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things says he who is holy... He who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength. You have kept my word and have not denied my name. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who pray they are Jews and are not but lie Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and know that I have loved you because you have kept my command to persevere. I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have that no one may take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. And he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God. And I will write on him my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now, many people, as they read through Revelation, that's as far as they get. Okay, we know about Philadelphia. We just read about them. But how much do you really know about Philadelphia from our reading of that passage? And there's nothing wrong to read the passages. In fact, Revelation chapter 1 says that blessed are those who read. Blessed are those who hear and blessed are those who listen. But I'll say there's a greater blessing to those who study. And at one point in time, Adventists were known of, as people of the, the book, not just reading it, but studying it. We came to be a denomination because... One man wanted to study the prophecies. And I would ask today, how many of us even know the prophecies that were once uh, a great doctrine for us to know? Could we share them with someone? 
What would we share with someone if they asked about Philadelphia? Well, I would like to look a little deeper today. I know that sometimes I run to people and it's like, well, we have devotions. We have worships at our house. And I said, do you really have devotions and worships? You spend 10 minutes in the evening with your kid reading a story. Is that really worshiping something? What we worship is what we devote our time to. Our devotions are really what we're devoted to. Spending 10 minutes in a book and spending two hours in front of a computer, what are you really worshiping? Spending 10 minutes, maybe reading a passage in scripture or spending an hour on your phone, what are you worshiping? Today we're going to spend a little time digging deeper to be able to see Jesus. You know, the Bible has a parable all about a man who dug for treasure. Well, he actually wasn't even digging for treasure. He was digging in a field and found treasure. And after finding that treasure, he reburied it because he wanted that treasure. And then he dug it up again after he bought the field. I thought, how great a value is God's word to us? How long are we willing to dig to find the treasure? And the true treasure is Jesus. That's the treasure of God's word. How valuable, how much of a treasure is Jesus to us? In Revelation, who is Jesus revealing to us? Himself. So if there's any book to really see Jesus, this is the book. And yes, he reveals himself. He reveals to us who we are in relationship to him and reveals to us our choices between choosing him or choosing man when it comes to worship. And today we get to read about a church who chose him. And here it says in Philadelphia, or to Philadelphia, which Philadelphia, we know, means the city of brotherly love. So just knowing what Philadelphia means, what does that mean to you when you think of a city with brotherly love? Did Jesus love Philadelphia? He did. But my question would be, did Jesus love Sardis? That was a dead church. He did. Did Jesus love the corrupt church? He did. And the compromising church, in the loveless church, Jesus loved them. But what made this church different is they loved Jesus. Jesus loves all of us. And he hopes, I think, within his deepest heart that we would reciprocate that love and return it back to him. Philadelphia did that. And we're going to see today how they did it. But they were the city of brotherly love. And Jesus truly was their brother. It says in Proverbs 18, 24, a man with many friends may come to ruin, but there is a man or there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. That friend is Jesus. Jesus is closer than any brother we may ever have. And you might have lots of friends because you show yourself friendly, but many of those friends, just like the prodigal son's friends, one day aren't going to be there for you. But Jesus will always be there. No matter what condition you're in or no matter what you find yourself in, and as a, as a church condition, he's, he's here for Laodicea too. He wants to be our brother. Then it reads here, these things says, he who is holy. Jesus is talking about himself. You think about the word holy, what comes to your mind? Is that something you can attain to? Sometimes you think of the word holy, I don't even like to think about it. It's like, holy, holiness is just too great. Jesus writes us and says, I'm writing this from he who is holy. In 1 Peter 1.16, Peter writes, be holy as I am holy. Those are the words of Christ. Jesus says, I'm holy, but what does he want from you? The same holiness. Now, holiness means that you're separate. You're separate from um, sin in the world. You keep yourself set apart for holy things and, and things that are godly. And Jesus says, I'm holy, and I want you to be like me. That's what he wants of his people in Laodicea. That's what he got out of his church in Philadelphia. Do I want to be holy today as Jesus is holy? Then he says this. I say these things, he who is holy, he who is holy true. How true are you today as you sit in your pew? I uh, was blessed by a concert last evening, and some of you were blessed by that too. Um, 
Matthew uh, Minicus and his wife Josie. Uh, they're a young Christian couple that uh, probably a little bit younger than me. And as they sang songs, they actually shared a testimony, which I think probably would have struck a chord in many hearts because they were being true. And truth strikes a chord. And they shared about their experience just in the last few years. And I can share it because they shared it in front of all of us. So if you were there, you would have heard it. But they said so many times they would go to churches just like ours here and they would share their hymns and their sacred songs and no one knew that they were on the verge of splitting up. We were on the verge of, of getting a divorce and ending everything, but we would get up every night and we would present ourselves as being just a godly, loving couple, but no one knew. I wonder how many people come to church and they shake hands on a given Sabbath and smile and say, how are things going? Oh, things are great. And you think that everyone has a perfect, perfect life and you're not going to share your imperfect life because, man, I'm the only one who's imperfect in church. Even pastors have imperfect lives. The elders that pray and read scripture have imperfect lives. And the problem is we all come to church as perfect and no one's being honest with anybody because we're afraid that someone might think less of us. Well, who cares what someone thinks of me? I know what Jesus thinks of me. He loves me and he wants me to be holy as he is holy. And to get there, I've got to be honest and say, Jesus, I'm struggling. I am not perfect, but you can help save me. And they said, we had the hardest time because we would not be honest with anyone because ultimately, you know, how could people know that we're struggling when we're singing? And they said, how, how many other people who come to churches have those same struggles? Now, people were quiet. And I'm not saying we all have to share our struggles to everyone in church. But I will say this. I hope there's someone in church that you trust enough that you could say, I'm struggling. Would you pray with me? I'm not saying get up from the pulpit and share everything you're struggling with, but there should be some brother or sister, hopefully, that you trust enough that they're not going to condemn you or judge you. But I'll say this today. If you know no one, Jesus is a brother who will not condemn you. He knows that we're imperfect. He knew the woman who was caught in adultery before she was even caught in adultery. He knew her struggles, and he said, I don't condemn you. Yes, we know the church is ready to cast stones at us. Your marriages fall apart. Let's get rid of these. These guys can't sing anymore. That's not how Jesus operates. He says, I want to heal you. You keep singing and your life's going to be a testimony for me. Because Jesus is a marriage healer. Jesus is a healer of broken relationships with parents and children. But we have to come to Jesus and be honest and say, Jesus, I need help. I'm not going to hide this because I don't want people to think less of me. Jesus like, I'm not. But we're part of the body of Christ. And we are to be, what I want to say, ambassadors, representatives of Jesus to bring reconciliation with that person and Jesus or that person with each other. And I thought, Philadelphia had that. Oh, if Laodicea would be open and honest instead of going around and saying, man, we're good. We're, uh, we're rich. We don't, we don't need anything, Jesus. It's like, no, you're miserable. <laughs> you're poor, blind, and naked. You need so much. Can we be honest as Jesus is honest? Because Jesus is holy and he's also true. And in order to be holy like he is holy, we've got to come to Jesus about our true conditions and not try to hide it. David didn't find healing until he was honest and said, look, Jesus, you're right. I committed adultery with Bathsheba and I killed her husband. And then after that, the Holy Spirit was able to come into his heart again and he was able to find healing. Jesus brings healing to brokenness. After that, Jesus says this about himself. He says, I am he who has the key of David. He who opens and no one shuts and he who shuts and no one opens. I wanted to stop there for a while because I thought, you know what, I don't, I don't know what... What's the big message about the key of David? In Isaiah 22, it talks about David, you know, being the one who had the key uh, of Jerusalem. What does it mean that Jesus has the key of David? You know, Scripture will interpret itself if you dig. Most people will stop right there and say, yeah, Jesus has the key of David. That's great. Let's move on. Well, what does it mean? Would you like to know? 
Let's open up to Matthew chapter 16. Because you know Jesus himself tells us what it means that he holds the key. And I'm glad he holds the key. And we're also privileged to be holders of the key as well. In Matthew chapter 16 and verse 19, Jesus says this. Matthew 16 verse 19, he says, And I will give you the keys, the keys of the kingdom. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. David had the key to Jerusalem. Jesus has the keys of the kingdom to the new Jerusalem. And he said, I'm going to give you those keys. Now, it's unfortunate that there have been church leaders that have abused this text. And they say, well, Jesus giving us his keys means we have the right to tell you whether you're going to heaven or hell. And if we lock you up in hell, you're not getting out. Well, maybe you can as long as you pay some indulgences. And if we say you get into heaven, we can still pull you out of there. But there have been religious leaders throughout the ages who said that God has given them the keys to say who gets to go in and who doesn't get to go in. Now, it's interesting. There's nothing there in this verse that say they have the right to say who goes into heaven and who doesn't. But it does say this. He said, whatever you loose will be loosed in heaven. Whatever you bind will be bound in heaven. Jesus came to loose the shackles and the chains of those in bondage. What helps loose someone who's in bondage? The everlasting gospel frees us from the bondage of our sin. And Jesus says, I'm giving you the keys, disciples, just like I've been loosing people from their chains and bondage. You can loose them from the chains of bondage and you can set them free so that they can be in heaven just like you have been saved to be in my kingdom. And if they reject the gospel, they'll stay bound in their chains. And those who stay bound on earth will miss out when they get to heaven. And those who are freed here on earth will be free to come into heaven. But our desire is for them not to stay bound, but they have the choice to make. What is it that looses a man or a woman from their chains of sin. In Luke chapter 11, verse 52, Jesus shares this of the Pharisees and lawyers of his time. See, they didn't do a very good job at loosing anybody. In fact, Jesus told them, he said, you go to win a convert, but you make them twice the sons of hell than you are. The religious leaders of Jesus' time had a big problem And honestly, religious leaders have had big problems throughout the ages because they haven't followed in the footsteps of Jesus. But in Luke 11, 52, Jesus says this, Woe to you lawyers. He's talking to the people who understood the commandments and understood God's word. They studied the law. And he said, Woe to you lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You did not enter in yourselves, and those who were entering in you hindered. It's the knowledge of the everlasting gospel, the knowledge of truly who Jesus is that sets men free from their bondage. And yet, these Jewish leaders did not share the truth about God. They did not share the truth about Jesus. And throughout the dark ages, the church followed right along in this. In fact, they kept the truth concealed. There was no word of God available to the common man during the dark ages locked away in the chains of dungeons and in basements. And you could only hear what a priest wanted you to hear. And it wasn't the truth of God's word. Much of, much of it was tradition of men, and much of it was just downright lies and falsehood so that they could clean your pocketbooks. And Jesus says, woe to you. You're not going to enter into the kingdom, and you're hindering other people because you have taken away the key of knowledge. God did a marvelous thing in the 1800s. You see, the key of knowledge was again presented to faithful people in Philadelphia. 
and they began to loose the bonds. They began to uh, free men and women again. In the 1800s, there was a great revival here in our country. You know, I preached last time I was here about a great revival taking place, taking place in Asbury, one university. When revival takes place, it's going to take place throughout. And people are going to be loosed from bondage of sin. And also, as they were being loosed, God was revealing truth to them. There was a man by the name of William Miller. I'm not going to go deep into the history. But he began to study prophecy. And as he began to study prophecy, other people wanted to study prophecy. And there was a deep hungering and desire for God's word. How much do you desire God's word today? If I ask, even in this room, how many of you know the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation? Whether it be the 2300-day prophecy, or the 70-week prophecy, or the prophecies of the beast, which a lot of people in today's age say, oh, these beasts are all literal beasts. They haven't studied scripture with scripture to realize these beasts are actually kingdoms that God has revealed to us that have existed throughout the ages. There's not a hunger for prophecy today. People don't want to study it. They don't know it. And I'm talking about people in the Adventist church that one time had a great hungering. During this time period of the early and mid-1800s, God was doing a marvelous thing. It was a time period of Philadelphia where people loved God's word and they loved each other. And I'll say this, when you love someone, you're willing to tell them the truth. You will show up them truths about themselves and truths that you've learned about God's word. And there was a little group that came out of this study and smelled like, well, those are just Millerites. Mil William Miller wasn't a Millerite, he was a Baptist. They gave him the title, actually, it was somewhat, it was derogatory to put him down and belittle him. Yeah, those are the Millerites. You should stay with the Baptist. But it wasn't just Miller and uh, Baptists that were studying, Methodists were studying, Congregationists were studying, Presbyterians were studying. There were many faiths that came together from studying. And they said, we want to be ready for Jesus to come. That's what we sang today. Do you want to be ready? And I'd venture to say most people, even within the church today, aren't ready and aren't getting ready. Do you want to be ready when Jesus comes? They wanted to be ready to the point where they're like, we will sell everything we have to be ready, but to warn others and to get them ready too. Do I want to be ready? In May 21, 1863, in Battle Creek, Michigan, the Adventist church started, a group of people who wanted to be ready. And that church began from believers that were Baptist and that were Presbyterian and Episcopalian and Methodist and Lutheran, Congregationalists and Quakers. Many denominations came together because they were kicked out of their churches. Why? Because they were studying. And God was giving them the keys to truth that would set men free. But their church leaders said, we don't want that. We want to hold on to traditions. Get out of here. And so this little group of 3,500 people started the Advent movement. And you think, wow, this little group who's facing opposition from everybody else. Everybody else, and I was looking at America, this is during the time of the Civil War. There were 30 million people in America at this time, right around. 30 million people, and 3,500 Adventists are probably thinking, how can we reach America? How can we tell them Jesus is coming? There's only 3,500 of us, and there's 30 million people in America. And that being said, there were over 19 million people that were in other denominations that were pushing back against them said, well, 19 million others and only 3,500 Adventists. How could that little group even survive? There's no way that group's going to make it to the end. I want to share with you 
some stats about the Advent people that started back in uh, May 21, 1863. Those 3,500 people have grown to 21 million, almost 22 million people. 22 million people. Today, there are over 95,297 churches. Those 3,500 people have grown to 95,297 churches. 72,975 companies, 229 hospitals, 129 nursing homes, 6,623 primary schools. We have two of them here in our district. 2,640 2, secondary schools. And um, as I was reading that, it's like God took this little group that were willing to persevere and press forward in the midst of a lot of persecution. They were willing to stay faithful and to study God's word. In the midst of that, God unlocked truths that no one knew. The truth about the Sabbath. There weren't Sabbath keepers up until that point, really. A few here and there. The truth about the second coming. The truth about the state of the dead. The truth about the sanctuary. The truth about spirit of prophecy. The truth about salvation. God's revealing truths that other churches didn't want. But there are people in those churches who wanted to hear it. You know, there are people in our community that still have never heard of the Sabbath before. There are people right here in Dunlop that haven't heard about the Sabbath. Their pastors haven't shared it with them. So who's going to share it with them? We, we should. If we're, if we're ready and we want to be ready for Jesus to come, and I, sometimes I, I think, what would these 3,500 people that started the church, if they were here today to look at the Adventist church, what would they say to us? When they saw our institutions, when they came to our schools, when they came to our colleges, when they came to our congregations, what would they say? Would they say we were ready like they were ready? We were accredited at our school. We had a group of people that came and said, this is what we think about your school. What would this group of 3,500 say? This is what we believe about the church today. Because even though there are 22 million on the books, doesn't mean there are 22 million ready or getting ready. My daughter sent me a text this morning. She woke up before me this morning. I was up late last night still thinking about some of the things I wanted to share today. And she said, happy Sabbath, Dad. That touched me, and that's all I got. Happy Sabbath. She's in Wisconsin right now visiting a, a cousin, and I'm glad I'm not there with her because it snowed nine inches the other day. And it's like, man, I don't want to be up there nine inches of snow. But this morning she said, Happy Sabbath, Dad. That makes me grateful right now. And I hope that if the world should linger, which I hope it doesn't linger, but if it did linger and she became an adult, I hope that when she's in her 20s, she would still write me, Happy Sabbath, Dad. So I know a lot of children today that were raised in Adventist homes that went to Adventist colleges no longer keep the Sabbath. I watched a concert that happened at one of our universities, not the whole thing, but it was just from one of the speakers. He said, you know, this concert happened and they, they had this singer that was singing at the college who I don't believe was an Adventist, was a non-Adventist singer doing a concert. And in the middle of it, he started mocking Sabbath keeping. It's like, you Saturday keepers, don't you know, it doesn't matter which day, any day can be the Sabbath. And he says it during the middle of one of his R&B songs where the kids are swaying. And you know what happened? They broke out in applause. They broke out in applause when the man said, any day can be the Sabbath. What day do you keep, he said, and they applauded. And I thought, this is sad. I know if one of those 3,500 people were there in that university, at that concert, they would have had something to say. They would have walked up and take, taken the mic from them and says, yes, the Bible has a lot to say about the Sabbath, and the Sabbath matters. And I'm glad today that my daughter told me happy Sabbath. Because we know that the Sabbath is a sign that Jesus is our creator and not we ourselves. That he is our sustainer and he's our provider and not we ourselves. Why do we keep the Sabbath? Because Jesus rested on that day at the end of creation. And he told us to remember when he gave us the commandments. Sabbath started way before that. And God brought the truth back to life in the 1800s and saying, hey, this matters to me. And it says, well, Jesus, if it matters to you, it matters to us. 
If the second coming matters to you and you're a brother, it matters to us. If the sanctuary matters to you, it matters to us because you're our brother and we love you. And since Jesus, we matter to you, Jesus, you matter to us. And that's a loving church. And Jesus tells us, and it was Mariah's memory verse this week. Jesus says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I love you. And I'll say this, you matter to Jesus today. And since you matter to Jesus, you matter to me. And everyone in this room should matter to everyone because we're brothers and sisters and we matter to Jesus. And he says, look, I want you to love each other like I love you, Peter, James, and John. I want you to love each other that same way. And since you matter to me, you need to matter to each other. And if you're struggling with an addiction, I'm not gonna judge you or condemn you for that. I want you to have the same victory that I wanna have over some of the addictions that I struggle with because God loves us. We matter to him and he promises us that we can be victorious. This church in Philadelphia believed that. I challenge you today, if you have older children that aren't walking in the faith, but you raise them in the faith, take your phone and text them happy Sabbath. They might not tell you, but I'll tell you what, they know it. My two brothers don't always keep the Sabbath, but they know the Sabbath. I can text them happy Sabbath. And their heart will be pricked because they know. They know it means something to God and it should mean something to them. So if your children aren't walking in the light that they were raised in, don't stop. Don't stop praying for them and don't stop sharing with them. Because the Sabbath was a day ultimately where Jesus, that's the day where he pours out his love. That's the day where he says, I'm not gonna work today because I love you. This is our day. Do I love Jesus enough to spend a day with him? Those sacred hours? I'm going to close by going to the end now. I, I wish I could spend more time, but I'm going to go to the end and try to go through the last things quickly. Philadelphia represented the church period during the early Advent movement. There was a great awakening in America amongst a lot of different Protestant denominations. And many people came out of the churches that didn't want to seek truth. And that's how this denomination started because there were truth seekers who say, we're coming out of churches that hold on to traditions and falsehoods rather than wanting to know the will and word of God. And Jesus said, because you have kept my commandments and persevered, in verse 10, I also will keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world. These people are resting today in the graves. They're sleeping and the next thing they're going to know, Jesus is going to say, well done, my faithful Philadelphia. Welcome to the joy of your kingdom. Jesus let them take a nap before the great trials that are about to hit our world. We're heading right to them. We might say, man, I wish I lived during Philadelphia. Well, let's live like Philadelphia. Let's be like them and have the same fervent and passion they had. And you know what? The time of trouble is actually to our benefit, Laodicea. Because it's during that time of trial that God's going to burn the dross off of our characters that we wouldn't let him do any other way. Where we're going to say, Jesus, we've got to depend completely on you right now. And he's like, yes, you do. You've always had to. You've said that you were wealthy and didn't need me, but you've needed me all along. So when you can't buy or sell, you know you've got to live and trust in Jesus fully to give you everything you need, which he's already been doing anyways. Here is the reward Jesus is going to give Philadelphia. And I'm going to say today, the reward can be yours too. He closes by saying this. He said, Philadelphia, I'm going to hold you uh, from having to go through the final trial. They're sleeping and resting right now. He says, behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast to what you have that no one takes your crown. And then he goes on to say this. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple. Hmm. What does it mean to be a pillar in the temple? Do you know in heaven there'll be no church like this? Everyone used to say, oh, the temple that Solomon built. What, what a wonderful temple. Even God told David, David wanted to build a temple. He's like, can you build me a building that can contain me, David? Really? You think you can put me in a little box and hem me in? And they thought it was so wonderful because, you know, here's Solomon building this big building out of gold. And God's thinking, that's the streets of heaven, Solomon. It's just bricks, buddy. You're going to walk on that. He says, one day you're going to be a pillar in his temple. In Revelation 21, 22, it says, but I saw no temple in it, talking about heaven. For the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. Jesus is the living temple. Just like the Bible said that he is the vine and we are the branches. 
Jesus says, I'm the temple and you are my pillars. He says it also in 1 Peter chapter 1, where he says, look, I want you to be, I want you to be pillars on blocks of my temple. I am the chief cornerstone, but I want you to be stones as part of this living temple. Ephesians chapter 2 says the same thing. God says, look, I'm the temple, and I want you to be a block in my temple, just as I want you to be a vine on my branch. Do you want to be a part, a pillar in Jesus' temple? He says, keep walking with me, overcome, and you'll be that. Then he goes on to say this, I'm going to write the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem. I thought about that for a while. God's going to write me uh, in the name of the city of his God, the new Jerusalem. I wish I had a phone book today. I'm sure if I have one, I'd find my uh, address in it because I'm part of the Bledsoe Phone Company. I'm still probably one of the few people who actually have a real phone number. Maybe some of you do have a phone number. My wife says, just switch to faster internet. You don't need a phone number. I got an actual phone number. And in that, it means I'm in the phone book and it's got my name and it's got my address. My daughter tells me sometimes, like, Dad, this is my address, too. I said, but it's my house. She's like, it's my house, too. And if your name's there in that address, then Noel's name's there in that address. I thought, think about it. Jesus is saying, look, New Jerusalem, that's my house. The Bible tells us he's built us a mansion there. One day, God's address can be our address. Think about that says the address of your heavenly father. Well, that's my address. God's house is my house. Wow, to think, what's your address, sir? Well, it's the same as my father's in heaven. I've got a heavenly address, and this is my heavenly father. It's the new Jerusalem. One day, God says, my address can be your address if you want it. Just like my kids have said before, dad, we're never leaving home. We just want to keep your address. Maybe you've had kids that tell them, but then one day they'll leave home and have kids and say, it's nice to have the same address of your parents. It's nice to have the same address as your heavenly father. And he says, that can be yours. I want you to have my address too. And then it closes that says that one day I'm going to write on you my new name. There are other verses that says I'm going to give you a new name, a new character. But now he's writing about how I'm going to write on you my new name. I thought about that for a little bit. You know, in the Old Testament, Jesus is not called Jesus. What was the first? He didn't, he didn't come to Moses and said, hey, Moses, this is Jesus here. He said, Moses, I am. You know, in Isaiah chapter 9, we sing the song for Christmas. It says, his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Even when he was here on earth, they didn't call him Jesus. They called him Yeshua. Now, there's nothing wrong with calling him Jesus. That's our, what we call him in English. But one day in heaven, Jesus is going to have a name above every name. And one day that name is going to be mine. I thought, wow. What is that name? I don't know. There's lots of names for Jesus in Scripture. I've got a Bible called the Names of God, and it's got hundreds of names for God and for Jesus. We put him in such a small little box and says, no, it's just Jesus, and that's the name he's always had and the name he always will have. He's like, no, I'm going to have a name that the whole universe recognizes but they're going to recognize you too because you went through something they never went through. One day I'm going to write on you my new name. It made me think of when I got married because ultimately Jesus is coming back for his bride. And when I got married, even when I got engaged, I remember my wife, before we were even married, she would be writing Sharon Snyder on papers. And maybe other girls did that too. They're like, I'm engaged now and I'm going to practice. Oh, I like how this looks, two S's instead of Sharon Hall. It's S.S., Sharon Snyder. And, you know, they're just so happy that they're going to take your name, that they're going to be part of your family because they love you and you love them. And Jesus said, you know, I love you, and one day you're going to get my name. And you'll write Rob, son of God. You'll write whatever your, last, whatever your first name is, daughter of God. He said, one day you're going to get to write my new name after yours because you're going to be my bride. I'm going to be your, your God, and you're going to be my people. And I thought... How bad do we want that? How bad do we want that? Philadelphia wanted that. They're sleeping and they're going to get it when they wake up. God's going to say, well done, you're pillars in my temple. Well done. 
you have my address. You're no longer living down there. You're in my house now. Well done. When you write your name, you get to write my name behind it. Jesus is coming. Are we ready? I hope today that we would have the same hope that our early pioneers had. Father in heaven, I would pray today that the same hope the Church of Philadelphia had in your soon return would be the hope that we would have. Father, today I would pray that we would have the same zeal and desire to have the keys that unlock the chains that bind so many, that they would want to be freed from the sin that's so easily entangled. Lord, just as the truth that you shared set captives free, the same truth we would share that would set captives free. Because, Lord, you desire each and every one to be pillars in your temple. You desire for each and every one to have your address in that new Jerusalem. You would desire that each and every one would have your new name. Father, we look forward to that day. And until then, Lord, keep us faithful as a church in Philadelphia. And we would be brothers and sisters that demonstrate your love one towards another. Because by this will all men know that we are your disciples by our love for each other. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.